All right, Kyle, thank you so much for joining me on the You're Not Alone podcast today. Um, I was really eager to, to have you on after watching your TED Talk. I feel that your message is super important, wanting to impact a million teens uh, and help them through their social anxiety is huge. And even when I was poking around on your website, as an advocate myself, just seeing that, th you know, 300 million people are impacted by anxiety worldwide is it's just such an astounding number. And I take I take great pride in knowing that people like yourself are it, it just feels cool to be a part of a community that's moving people in this direction of psychological well-being and. Gosh, I, I, you know, I, I think to, I'm imagining a part of your story right now. I can picture it and just how many people go through that. But I want to give you kind of the opportunity to share that with my audience. So just give, give my audience real quickly that sort of that 30 second quick introduction on yourself. Sure. So yeah, my name's Kyle Mitchell. And like you mentioned, I'm a teen social anxiety speaker. So basically what I'm doing is I am being the person that I wish I had in high school, especially uh, that was the toughest time for me, uh, really facing my social anxiety. Now I had social anxiety pretty much my whole life. Didn't really know what it was at the time, yeah. but I really had to like come face to face with it when I switched high schools and went from this really small private school to this very large public school. And that's really when my journey began. <laughs> I'll, yeah. just, I'll start there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so I want to unpack that story because uh, I feel that it it's important for those teens right now listening to this to sort of hear your message. And, and largely, I mean, that's why the title of my book, you can see it over my shoulder right there, is You're Not Alone, right? Trying to find it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it... it it, it, just let them know that they're not alone. So when you transferred high schools, went from a high school of, I think you said like 300 kids to a high school of somewhere between like 1200 to 1600 students. Um, what, I guess, walk us through the start of that sort of that transition for you. Yeah. So to start off, I realized that the bus dropped me off, you know, 40 minutes before my first class started. And I didn't know what to do for 40 minutes because this is my first time being at a public school. I literally knew no one there. Um, it was the first time even not having to wear a uniform to school. So I'm like, I'm totally out of my element. Yeah. Uh, I, anybody would be totally out of their element in the situation I was in. Yeah. And then just kind of pile social anxiety on top of that. And personally, I wanted to just go, you know, be by myself and just sit, sit by myself in the hallway or something. Like I would have been fine doing that. But I feared, you know, I would be negatively judged by people around me. Like people would think I'm a loser or I have no friends, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So I quickly, you know, on my feet was like, all right, I got to come up with some sort of plan to like kind of blend in with everybody. So the spotlight's not on me. Right. And that's when I came up with the plan to just walk the halls in circles for 40 minutes every day. Yep. And it's worked really well for a while. You know, I was able to blend in. I kind of uh, compare my high school was kind of like an airport. Like there's so many people in that you couldn't really tell, you yeah. know, who's walking through. Like surely no one would be able to tell. I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. But uh, one day somebody did. So I got on the bus heading home from school and, you know, somebody called me out in front of everybody and said, you know, why do you walk the halls and circles every morning? Yeah. And yeah, that's when I just had this feeling that we've all had at least one point in our lives where it feels like your heart just drops down into your stomach. Yes. And I just felt so embarrassed and ashamed. And from that point forward, I didn't walk the halls anymore because I feared you know, everybody knew what I was doing now. I was super embarrassed about it. And I would just go in the bathroom and I would sit in the stall and I would cry and just kind of reminisce with all these thoughts that were just cycling in my head. Like I wasn't good enough. I couldn't make friends. Why can't I be normal like everybody else? And that's that's what my uh, high school experience was, at least to begin with. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I just feel like so many people can relate to that. Um, 
And it, like, as you're telling that story, it's like nowadays I'd pull out my Apple watch and be like, I'm getting my steps in. Don't <laughs> right. mind your own business. I'm getting to 10,000 before you even take your first bite of breakfast. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, trying to, trying to make light of it, but no, I mean, it's in all seriousness. I mean, social anxiety, anxiety is so it, it can be so all consuming and it can trap you. And we get fused to our thoughts. Like, you playing these thoughts over and over again in your head of I'm not good enough. Um, why can't I just be normal? Why can't I just make friends? And then the other side of that too, where you start to build like the anxiety because we're so wrapped up in the anxiety, you also like, it, there's sort of this pressure that builds up around like, gosh, like you haven't talked to anybody. And if you do talk to somebody, like, how are you going to keep the conversation going? Are mm -hmm. they going to find out that, that I came from a private school? Are they going to find out that, that I like, I don't have any friends yet. What if I say something stupid? What if I do something embarrassing? What if they think I'm boring and don't like me? So there's in your, it, all of this messaging is happening while you're just trying to live and breathe and operate in, in your space, which it just, it becomes, it, it becomes all consuming and so overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. You, you nailed it on the head. Yeah. It just, it becomes debilitating. How I kind of describe it a lot of time is mm, social anxiety used to make my life decisions. So I couldn't do anything, couldn't make any decision without like running it by social anxiety first. And then whatever, you know, he said, I was like, okay, then I'll do this type of thing. But like, I literally didn't make decisions for myself. It was all, you know, based on whether I could handle it, whether my social anxiety could take on doing that. Um, one, one big example was like, I played soccer my entire life, yep. loved it, enjoyed the heck out of it. It was pretty good in my opinion. But when I switched to this school, I didn't do it anymore, even though I loved it more than anything, because I just had so many anxious thoughts about it. I wasn't going to be as good as everyone else. I didn't yeah. know anybody on the team. And I quit doing something I loved because of social anxiety. And, you know, I, I'm OK with that decision now. I don't like kind of like reminisce on it or ruminate on it rather. But, man, I don't yeah. want others to like miss out on like really cool opportunities or things that they love because of something like anxiety. Like, oh man, that's, that's not fair to you. It, it totally isn't. And it's funny that you bring that up I, because so I've, I've been an anxious person my entire life. Of course, didn't have words for it back when I was much younger, but yeah. anxiety absolutely ruled my life on the basketball court. Love basketball still to this day. Um, but I would get so crippled like while other people are just in a flow state on the court, I'm like having thoughts of like this anxious thinking around like, do people like me? Like, oh, did I just make a mistake? Is the coach going to take me out of the game? What if I miss this shot? Are my teammates going to be pissed at me? Like, what if I make a bad pass? This, that, and the other. And it just made it. It's just, it's interesting too for, to, for me to hear you say that like, you loved soccer so much, but you, because of your anxiety, like you literally quit playing it. And for me, I feel like what happened for me is I got so wrapped up in the anxiety versus enjoying the sport that I stopped. I almost like pushed myself out of the sport because I stopped enjoying it and I stopped performing at a high level and sort of just drifted out of it. But it was it it was all like it, years later, looking back on it, it was all anxiety related. And yeah. obviously skill at some point, you know, like I don't think I was going to go on to play pro like professional basketball, but in high school, like sports are supposed to be fun, um, which is like something I saw on your Instagram where uh, you like you're like uh, one of your things was like, you're too young to be anxious. And it's like, well, actually, it turns out that that's not true at all. Like anxiety starts at can start at a very early age. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, with sports, uh, I, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. I mean, I, I think all the time, like if I, if I would have had, I don't want to say my anxiety under control, but if I had like the strategies to like cope with anxiety and like understood it a little bit, man, I would have been so much better as a player because like, I am second guessing everything on the field of like, where should I be? Should I be here? Is my coach thinking this, that, and the other? 
man, if I would have had just the utmost bit of confidence, like it definitely would have been a lot better. And it just, just going back again to like, yeah, it's just not fair, fair to yourself to let anxiety, you know, control you like that. And that's why professional athletes are take so much more investment into mental health now yeah. because there is, I mean, you have to, I mean, I can't imagine. That's like my favorite thing about watching like the NBA finals and stuff is like, the mental mindset fortitude yes. that you have to have to play in that kind of pressure when people are talking trash about you every night on, you know, NBA on TNT or whatever. Yeah. It's like, man, that's, that, that's incredible. Like to be able to deal with all that and then still go and play basketball with like the best people in the world. That's yeah. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> I completely agree. And like, I even, I think about Steph, like game game five, I think he, he he went over like he didn't hit yeah. a single three first time in like a crazy amount of games over a hundred can't remember the exact number. Everybody's of course running running their mouths on all of the sports channel. What's up with Steph? This that and the other. Yeah. And then he just comes back and just absolutely just dominates. He had a thirty plus point game. Was a huge reason why they closed out the series in Game Six and. To your point, I just think about that mental fortitude, but I also think about, you know, the individual, the professional athletes that they live with anxiety, like Kevin Love. Um, they live with the uh, uh, with depression. Demar Derozan, like, it, like, it just some of it is, and of course, like, the media isn't thinking about people's mental health, which probably is an issue. That's why we're sharing these stories, and this is so important. Sure. But like as an athlete, just coping with that on a daily basis would be so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, that's why it's so important, not just for, you know, athletes, but just in general to be proactive with your mental health. If, you know, if you're sitting there listening, like, Oh, I don't have social anxiety or, you know, I don't struggle with anxiety all too much. doesn't mean you shouldn't be proactive with your mental health in general. Like what are you doing on a daily basis to making sure like you're at the most optimal level that you can be. And yeah. I'm not saying like you can't ever have bad days because I definitely have those for sure. But I'm always like working to striving to be like at the best that I can be. And I know that if the more proactive that I can be, the the less that I can, you know, go in a downward spiral or, you know, get burnt out or, you know, whatever it may be. But I, you know, I stress being proactive. I think we're way too focused as a society on being react, uh, proactive, reactive about mental health instead of proactive. Like yeah. let's, let's, what can we do before it gets, you know, to into before the, the panic attack or, you know, the anxiety attack, what can we do to prevent those things from happening as much as possible as opposed to, okay, what do we do in this moment? That stuff's really important too, but I think the focus should be more on the proactive side. Definitely. And I want to I want to touch on that later on in the interview. But I'm curious um, for the individual right now who's tuning in, who's trying to figure out if they have social anxiety or not. What are some of the signs that they that they should look for? What are some of the cognitions like what are people with social anxiety? What are they thinking? We've talked about some examples, but are there any more that you can provide? Sure. So, I mean, I'll just give a general definition at first and I'll kind of go over some examples. Um, it's basically feeling like anxious in social situations. And it's like feeling like, or it's almost like perceiving others are having like thoughts about you. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you feel like you're a mind reader type of thing. I, I like to use that example. It's almost yeah. like you can know what people are thinking about you. You see somebody in the corner, you know, having a conversation with someone else and they're laughing. And then you're thinking to yourself, are they laughing about me? Are they yeah. making fun of me? Is it because of this weird smiley face shirt I got on right now? Yeah. Like th that's the type of thing that it is. Um, uh, just I like your I shirt, mean, by the way. And for people <laughs> watching the video, it's a great shirt for those on audio. It's, it's a great shirt. Just so you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, some other examples, um, I mean, just a personal one from like school, like I felt anxious about doing things like turning in my test or assignment first in front of that everyone in the class. Like I would wait until there was a group of people getting up to go turn in the assignment and then I would get up with them. Yeah. I didn't want to be like the first one, even though a lot of times I was the first one done because yeah. I felt 
Like people are going to be looking at me. Oh, Kyle's already done. There's no way he did that good. Like just honestly, just caring way too much about what others think in an overwhelming way. Yeah. Same thing with like blowing my nose. Did never do that there in class. Never wanted to blow my nose in front of people. I was just like went to the bathroom in the stall and did it that way. Mm. So it's just where you have just these overwhelming amount of like thoughts of what others may or may not be thinking about you. And it's controlling what you're doing. It, it can, yeah, and it controls all of your behavior and your world sort of gets smaller and smaller through that process too, right? Like yeah. for you, it at probably at the lowest moments, it was like you just felt so alone, felt like, how am I going to make friends? How am I going to connect with people? How am I going to overcome this, right? Yeah, absolutely. What was the turning point for you? The turning point for me, well, I mean, my my high school career, I kind of just got by um, and by just reaching out for help and talking to my counselor and, you know, my parents just really opening up um, that that made it to where it was released enough of a burden where it was manageable. OK. And then my turning point was really when I was in college and I remember, you know, walking into the bedroom of my apartment and I just heard this voice, you know, clear as day inside my head, Mm. you know, Kyle, you've got to do something about this. Like quit taking pity on yourself and start taking action. Yeah. And that's when, you know, it clicked for me. And that's when I remembered something my dad told me when I was in high school and I kind of told him about all this stuff and he's given me some advice that I wasn't ready to hear or take action on at that point. Yeah. But he's telling me to, you know, do something outside my comfort zone. And he Mm. gave me an example, like when he was younger, he was living in Vegas and I don't think he had social anxiety per se, but he wasn't very good at talking to people. was kind of shy, that type of thing. So he actually went and studied to become a blackjack dealer yeah. And then started dealing blackjack at, in Las Vegas, which if you don't know is a super high pressure job. To yes, do. yes, and unique I, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I said blackjack. It's a uh, actually crap stealer. Um, which on top of that, not only you're dealing with people, just the amount of rules behind that game is ridiculous. I still don't understand how to play. Yeah. But, same. Um, <laughs> so he told me that, and you know, at the time I wasn't ready to hear it. But when I, you know, was in my apartment, I thought. Okay, that's what I need to do. I need to find something that is manageable on my level. Like, what can I do that's not like super overwhelming? Like, what am I battling with right now? And in college, we had this participation part of the grade, which was at least new to me. We didn't do this in high school. Mm. Um, And the participation part of the grade was more than just showing up to class. You actually had to raise your hand and stuff like that and actually answer and ask questions, which I always was petrified of doing. (laughs) I always just tried to, you know, stay under the radar type of thing. Um, So I was like, well, that's what I got to do because one, I'm petrified of this, but it's manageable for me to do. And two, this is a win-win because this will help my grade. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to do something, like I said, manageable. And I'm like, okay, I can raise my hand one time in every single class. Like I can do that. Mm. It'll, It'll be tough, but I can do it. So I set off, you know, my first class to go do that. And, you know, I'm sitting in class and of course I procrastinate to the very end because I'm just kind of going back and forth in my head. Like you don't need to do this. Yeah. I don't don't even think I even listened to a word. Yep. But uh, towards the very end, last, you know, five, 10 minutes, you know, I raise my hand and I ask or answer a question. I don't remember, but I did it. And I remember feeling so good about that. And I continue to do this and I stay consistent with it. I, I did this every single day. And I, then I noticed after about, you know, four five, six weeks, maybe that I wasn't feeling anxious about raising my hand anymore. Yeah. Like I would, and in fact, I was actually enjoying it, especially with the classes that I was interested in. Mm. And I was raising my hand multiple times, even though I was only challenging myself to do it once. Yeah. And I was having fun with it. Like I was feeling so good and confident about myself for the first time ever like that. And that's when it became addicting to me. And I was like, oh, I got to keep doing this. What else can I do? And so that's when the uh, 
yeah, the process is just consistently keep on doing these challenges and going outside my comfort zone. And I still do this. I mean, still present to this day, I'm doing this. I'm always just looking for ways to, what can I do to like go further outside my comfort zone? Because that's the growth zone. And I'm all about growing while, while I'm here on this earth. Like, I, I don't want to just live and just kind of like walk by, like, I want to see how much I can grow. Where can I get? Like, that's what I want to see. Yeah. And I consistently see that with people that ultimately I feel it, it look, I don't think people can be happy all the time, right? Where it's mm-hmm. actually more about building acceptance around feeling all of the emotions yeah. where that's where we really start to free ourselves. Right. Which, and I think especially as human beings, we put ourselves in this box of like, these are the emotions I'm supposed to feel. This is what I'm allowed to feel. But consistently, I notice that people with that growth mindset, just they just they they are at a bare minimum. They are tolerant to some level of discomfort, just getting uncomfortable on somewhat of a regular basis. I don't you know, I don't I don't add in and, and keyword being manageable. But the ones that want to get the most out of their life while they're here on the planet, I see time and again, seem to be the happiest, more fulfilled individuals. Um, And so I just love that. I mean, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is the most terrifying at the beginning because you're building a new skill. And our brain's natural propensity is to keep us safe. So your anxiety is sending all this messaging. If you speak up, if you raise your hand, this is bad is going to happen. This is what is going to happen. And you talk about this in your TED talk, but the exposure and there's exposure therapy um, for those listening where like the whole concept is exposing yourself to manageable levels of anxiety inducing situations. You talk, you talk about dipping the toe in the anxiety water, you know, and that is that was such a huge part of my recovery process where and even you were talking about public speaking so i had a mentor come and i loved public speaking uh so much so that i started doing a lot of it down in raleigh north carolina when i was living there uh, my whole life i'd done you like you can always connect the dots looking backwards type of deal um i'd always done public speaking always really enjoyed it but once i started to experience anxiety it was like going up and talking in front of people, it it felt so different from before. Like I was, it was terrifying. And early on in my speaking career, like I would be to the point where I felt like I was going to faint and pass out. And I had all these signals in my head, like, do not go up on that stage. You're (laughs) going to forget your words. You're going to mumble. You're going to fall. You're going to do something stupid. And because it was the career path I chose, I was like, well, I don't really have an option. I need, I have to go up on this stage. Otherwise I'm not going to get paid and I'm not going to be able to, to contribute to, to my wife and I's household. But, um, it's just amazing that the exposure over time, how much that's changed. I don't, do I still experience anxiety before speeches? Yeah. Especially if it's been a little while, like speaking season is very, it's, it's, it's on and off, it's on and off. So there can be gaps in between, but the exposures, which is what you're talking about are so it it's for anxiety, any type of anxiety, but especially with social anxiety, it is one of the keys to overcoming that anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, and you're going to have to do it in some form, some capacity, you're going to have to go outside your comfort zone. If you want to get where you want to be with, you know, with your anxiety levels, it it just, it just has to be done. So just accepting that and just being like, all right, I have to do this. Like, let's go. And like, like you said, doing something really, really small. I mean, something that you just feel it just a little bit, and then you can work your way up and you'll start doing things that were big to you, you know, five years ago, but now they're just, uh, you know, there's still a little, a little anxious, but it's, I still don't do anything that's like way out of bounds. Um, it'd be hard to think of something that would be that far out of bounds now, honestly. Not to say I'm like the most like confident. My comfort zone is so freaking huge type of thing. But um, I mean, like this week, I did an uncomfortable challenge. And it was something that I've been like kind of thinking about for a while. Mm. Um, and it was with it was probably something that's uh, 
not something you'd think of as an uncomfortable challenge, but it was for me. So for like me and my parents, for whatever reason, I noticed like since high school, which has been about 10 years at this point, yep. that we don't really say I love you to each other very much. Yeah. And I was feeling very uncomfortable saying it to them. But even though I do love them and I knew they loved me. Yeah. So that was my uncomfortable challenge this week. I went to their house. Oh, that's after I dropped my kids off. And I just kind of talked to him like, hey, I'm just curious. Why do you think we don't say I love you to each other very much? And like that was a super uncomfortable thing for me to do. But I'm so glad I did it because now I feel so much better and so much closer, so much better relationship with my parents yeah. because I brought up this. So it's it's more than just the anxiety, but doing things like that. I mean, like I built a stronger relationship with my parents because I went outside my comfort zone. Like the things that you can get and grow from outside that comfort zone goes far beyond anxiety. And sometimes things will happen that are just like bonkers, crazy, wild. But it's like, man, I'm so glad I did that. Like, that is awesome that that just happened. <laughs> yes. And you talked about that in your TED talk, too. I The ventral media medial, right? Or the pre is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, the ventral medial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ventral medial, the prefrontal cortex becomes more active when you take into account your own personal values. Mm -hmm. So I always talk about living a values-based life. That's not a concept that I came up with, but it's one that I've adopted and I've found works really well in my mental health practice, which is another thing you talk about um, versus it being a destination. And yeah that's kind of the example of what you're talking about. Like clearly you value deep connection um, with your family, with your parents. And part of that deep connection is being able to say, I love you without like expressing that, letting them know that you care about them. Um, so yeah. starting up, starting up those exposures like that are huge um, for, for the listeners right now. I love your three-step process because it's super simple. Will you kind of walk them through, your three-step process to overcoming social anxiety? Yeah. So step one is building self-love somehow, some way, um, tons of ways to do this. I'm personally a big fan of like self-affirmations. I like, you know, saying them into the mirror. I like to play like really upbeat music while I do it. So I can like get emotionally invested into the affirmations that I'm saying. Yeah, Because if you're emotionally invested, it's much easier to believe those things that you're saying, especially mm. when you're saying things like, I am confident when, you know, you don't feel that way. Yeah, But you can like say it like you actually believe it. That's um, super powerful. And I think self-love is just one of the most powerful things for social anxiety. Because I think people with social anxiety, I think that's one of the most lacking things. Because yeah. if like you can truly love yourself and you love everything about you, would you care about what others may or may not be thinking about you? Probably not very much, if at right. all. So if you can build that self-love, that's super helpful with that. And then step two, going about kind of what we've been talking about is Real finding, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Could we pause on the self-love? Because I think people are going to want to know the different ways to build that up. Because self-love gets used <laughs> a lot, but it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So what is what does building up self-love and self-confidence look like for you and any advice that you would have for somebody listening right now? Yeah. So yeah, just finding ways to love you for who you are. Um, kind of what we talked a little bit about earlier is sometimes finding acceptance for things. So like for me, I had to accept that I hate that I have blonde hair. But I kind of like accepted that myself and learned to like love that part about myself. Like I'm a unique human being with this pale blonde hair and I love it. Like not too many people are <laughs> that look like me and they get super red when they're hot right now, apparently. But, you know, who cares? Like I love that about me. Yeah. Uh, also, I found that just finding ways to like just be easy on yourself yeah. and not so hard on yourself. I started, or let me back up a little bit. I was experiencing a lot of like burnout, especially during the pandemic of just like feeling like I had to meet these certain goals at these certain times. And man, if I wasn't able to get up at this uh, certain time, I would just feel really bad about myself. And man, I just like pushed myself to the max so hard for so long that 
all of a sudden then I would burn out for like a couple of weeks and then I would hardly have any like energy and I'd feel depressed for like two weeks and I couldn't do anything. Yeah. And then once that was over, I finally got over it. I'd do the same thing again. Then I'd burn out. So I started instituting play into my day. So usually at three o'clock, I will stop my, my work and I'll go do something for myself. Mm. And play can be a lot of different things to a lot of people. Yeah. So like, I have like a really like productivity type mindset. So yeah, sometimes play for me is like cleaning parts of the house. Like I just enjoy that. And it makes me feel happy. I don't yeah. do that every day. Sometimes I'll go like play a game of Madden on Xbox. Yeah. Um, you know, I, cause I, that was something like I cut out of my life cause I was like, not productive at all. This doesn't help me. I'm not going to do it. But I instituted that back in and started putting in more play like that. And, you know, I'm not playing Xbox all day or just cleaning all day or, you know, doing play all day in general, but finding a way to just put a little bit of time every single day. And that has prevented me from getting to that burnout stage that was just, gosh, not fun. If you've gone through that, not, not fun at all. I but, have. Uh, yeah, that has been uh, extremely helpful. So that, that would be some other ways that I would say to institute self-love and why it's important. I, I resonate with that t to the highest extent. I <laughs> burn myself out so many times in this journey since starting. I started the business in 2020 and it, I mean, the pandemic hit like two, <laughs> two weeks later. So there was obviously some fear around like, okay, I need to like make this work. This is my full-time job. I'd been doing it on the side for a few years and, um, but I had these rigid rules have to be up at this time, have to work until this time. This is what entrepreneurs do. This is like, uh -huh. this is productive. This isn't. So therefore it's out. And it was like, well, and I had like this unhealthy belief system. And so, so many of us are like, we're ruled and, and, and guided by these belief systems. But like my belief system, one of them was like entrepreneurs work from sunup to sundown. Uh -huh. Like that was one of them. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it, it became, oh, and here's another one. Like, okay, well, when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That's not true. <laughs> work is still, there is still a work component. Do it. Yeah. Am I way more grateful and way more happy and way more enthusiastic when I am doing things? Would I rather be doing this than my old job? Yes. This, this is interesting to me. I enjoy this. But if I only did this every single second of every single day, am I going to burn myself out? I learned, yes, I am. And to yes. your point, incorporating play is the equivalency to me of asking myself every single day, multiple times throughout the day, is this making me happy? Like really thinking about, we have to start to shift. I like productivity. I like the idea behind it, I think that people that contribute, that feel like they're contributing, that feel like they're tied back to a bigger mission, tend to be happier people, especially when it's helping others. Like the studies just show that time and again, right? But like, yeah. and I, I have that same productivity mindset. It's like, not everything has to be productive. Or like, it, it's productive to have play. Like, that is a part of the recharging process because I was doing the same thing. I would burn myself out and then I would just be wiped of energy for a few weeks. And then I'd be like, oh, energy's back. G -g -g time to gun yeah. through everything again. And then I would just, I was on the same hamster wheel too. So I resonate with that. Um, and I think once I started to shift some of those belief systems, it was easier to show myself some of that self-care, that self-love that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's hustle culture for you, right? Uh, I think uh, many entrepreneurs are just like influenced by that, like so hard. But yeah, I, yeah, setting like rigid rules for myself was a big one for sure. Like I used to like wake up at like crazy hours in the morning for I don't even know how I even did it for so long. Yeah, but yeah, I just yeah I had to set like different rules for myself and. Not even rules, but like I accept boundaries. Like, like I said, like I stop work at 3 p.m. because yep. like that's what works for me. If I work past that, then I feel way too stressed because then I'm going from work to 
hanging out with my kids and making dinner all at the same time. And like, and then it's just like this vicious cycle of like work, make dinner, sleep, go again. Do it again. And like not, not fun at all. That's not fun to me. Like, I don't want to, I don't want my life to be like that every single day. So yeah, that's, that's why I, I changed those rules up. But yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that, man. That's, that's important. People, a lot of people are going to, are going to benefit from hearing that. Um, so the second part of the process is finding uncomfortable challenges, essentially exposing yourself to in little marginal ways. And you can do this mm. with a therapist. Did you do this with a therapist or were you kind of your, your own guide for this? I did this on my own for this. Yeah. Okay. So you can, for people listening, you can, there is such thing as exposure therapy. There's therapists that specialize in this. There's also a ton of books out there that can help you kind of walk through those uncomfortable challenges. Can you give sort of your perspective on how to start, like how somebody can start that has social anxiety? Sure. So I, I think the best way to do it is to not do it by yourself. <laughs> At least have some sort of accountability partner yeah. Um, whether that be a therapist or a friend, parent, you know, sibling, whatever, find somebody that you can talk to and say, Hey, you know, explain to them what's going on and say, Hey, I want to try and get this done by Friday. Like, can you hold me accountable for that? Um, that'll, that'll make it a lot easier in the sense of you won't, it's just too easy to do it by yourself to be like, eh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it yeah. tomorrow. I just keep saying that every day type of thing. So I, I think that's a big thing. Um, and then besides that, just, yeah, just finding something really small. And to give you an example of how small you can do is wave at a stranger today. Smile Don't at a wave. stranger today. Like that is something super small that you can do and is, is super manageable. And that might make you anxious, makes lots of people anxious to do that. Um, seems like a lot of times we just like try to avoid eye contact from people when yes. we're walking next to. So yes. I challenge you, if you're listening, you struggle with anxiety, smile at someone or wave at someone, uh, do one of those. That's, those are really good, like starting points. And then just kind of build from there. I love that. I love that. Um, it's funny that you bring that up too. Cause I noticed I had a, like a, some lingering anxiety after the pandemic, um, like, walking down the sidewalk and seeing somebody coming towards me and being like, what am I going to do when I cross paths with them? And like, like wanting to like go across the other side of the street to just avoid it or like throw in my AirPods and, or like even um, have sunglasses on and just look straight ahead. Like these were things that I sort of thought about. Um, and I just decided, I was like, nope, when you pass by somebody, you're going to, you're just going to tap into basic human. Like you're just going to, tap into the decency um, that is being a human. And so I love those small exposures because those are things that I started to do and they work. You get more and more comfortable just interacting with humans um, and sort of creating that, again, acceptance around, okay, I might feel a little uncomfortable, but knowing that in the long run, that exposure is gonna allow you to sort of expand your life out, I think is huge. So then the third part, which, Everybody, people are going to love this who are listening. What is the third part of your process? So I like to reward myself for these challenges, but I like to reward my efforts and not the results because these challenges should only be effort-based. So if like I go back to my hand raising thing, like my challenge was to just raise my hand and ask or answer a question, not to answer a question right. Yes. So that's, that's the difference. It shouldn't ever be results oriented and we should focus on the effort because that's what we have control of. We have no control over the results. Yeah. I do, I've done tons of uncomfortable challenges and I can always control my effort, but I've never been able to control the results of whatever happens. Mm. I mean, sometimes it will go exactly how you want it to. Um, sometimes it won't and that's okay. And sometimes really cool stuff happens. I mean, I've I've had some really cool things happen just from <laughs> just from doing these uncomfortable challenges and um, yeah, just kind of putting myself out there. Uh, I mean, one time like we went for anniversary, my, my wife and I, and we stayed we we're staying at this nice hotel or whatever. 
And I just asked the guy at the front desk, I was like, hey, can we get anything free since it's our anniversary today? And he's like, uh, sure, got a bottle of champagne if you want that. I was like, dope, let's go. Love that. <laughs> like, why not? Like, just go. Um, so yeah, just reward. Yeah, reward your efforts. Forget the results. I know we live in like this results oriented society where it's, I mean, ever since like we're little, like we're graded by A, B, C, D, or F type of thing. But it's like, it's really all about your effort. And I just kind of like think back about like my kids, like as they're growing, as they're growing up right now, because I have three kids, eight, six, and four. And like, if I know my daughter like put in her full effort on an assignment and then failed it, I wouldn't care because she put in her effort. Like she did everything she could. Right. Like she put in the work, like just there's some sort of disconnect there. Like the result is not what I'm going to reward it for. I'm always going to reward the effort. And I think we need to start thinking more like that, not just with ourselves, but just for really everything in general, because why are we putting rewards on things that we can't control? Like that's, it's almost kind of random. Like, so start rewarding yourself based on those efforts that you can control. And that helps your train your mind to focus on the effort because we like to focus on the result. We do. And I, I love that analogy with the grades because it's just so true. We live in a society that focuses like from the moment you're I mean, from six years old, you're you're getting graded on assignments, which is just it, saying that out loud is wild to me. I mean, I guess it's it's a way for human beings to measure our performance, I suppose. And maybe in that grade there's effort implied perhaps but to your point there's nuance and just because you didn't maybe do well on a grade or, or or i mean on a homework assignment or an exam that doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't try um <laughs> and i also then go to okay well also there are certain classes too that maybe that their class just is not aligned with your values it's just not what you care about it's not what you're interested in and yeah. You could put effort in until you're blue in the face, but like, is it moving the needle in the direction that you want to go? And I think that is why I've enjoy enjoyed adulthood so much more because in school it was like, okay, I want to get A's and B's in all of my classes, but there were just classes I didn't care about. I just didn't. Um, yeah. And in adulthood, there's just been that opportunity to just tap into things that are interesting to me. And what I've found is that effort sort of follows the interest if that makes sense now granted with anxiety and exposures one might not say i'm super interested and passionate about exposures uh so there is there is a discipline <laughs> component <laughs> there is a discipline component but i love that analogy i think that that's just that's just great so to sort of wrap up the podcast here um how can people connect with you and your mission yeah. So, I mean, you can connect with me on social media. I'm social anxiety, Kyle website, social anxiety, Kyle.com. Um, go give the Ted talk a watch. That's what I would most likely most like you to do. Go give that a watch, not only watch it, but take action on it and share it with somebody who needs it. It's like I said, I'm trying to reach my 1 million and I can't do it by myself. So I need your all's help to share the message. Um, it's been really cool. People, I mean, I've got so many awesome emails of people not only saying like they really like the TED Talk, but they, you know, they shared it with their their granddaughter or their daughter or friend or whatever. And like, that's what I get most hyped on. Like, yes, yeah. yes. Share it with somebody else who needs it. Cause I mean, that's the first step is awareness. And once you can get that awareness of like, oh, I'm not alone kind of like uh, your podcast here. <laughs> yep, yep. It's, it becomes a, a lot more manageable in your mind. It, it does. And I, and I love that, man. I align with your mission. That's why I wanted to bring you on because hopefully some, there are some teens in, in my audience that are going to watch or listen to this episode um, and they're going to find themselves in your story and, and sort of begin to work that process um, that you outlined. So to kind of wrap things up, what is one piece of advice that you would give someone who is at the start of their mental health journey right now? Um, one piece of advice. 
I would say, I guess I'm just kind of assuming that you're struggling with mental health currently. I would say ask for help. Go reach out to somebody, somebody that you trust. Don't try to do it alone. It's it's just never a good idea. (laughs) Go reach out to somebody for help. There is somebody that you can reach out to. And that includes like me and I'm sure Zach. Um, Reach out to somebody. There is someone in your life that you trust, that you love, that loves you back that you can reach out to and ask for help because don't try to do this alone. And it is so much easier when you can unpack that emotional baggage that maybe you've been holding on to for years at this point, and you will be in disbelief how good it feels to unpack that out. It does. It does. It feels so good to just unpack (laughs) it and and talk to somebody and release that. And even better to hear a story that makes you know you're not alone to your point. So I appreciate you coming on, Kyle. I'm rooting for you and your mission to a million. Um, And I hope you continue to impact lives. And I just appreciate you coming on to the show, man. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Zach. This was fun. Okay, right on, Kyle.